Uh, she's currently working with the Janus Foundation, and she's been very instrumental in directing the Mending Nations series of programs that have been going on around the Bay Area. So I turn the program now over to Sue Richter. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. And I'd like to give you a special thank you for organizing this event tonight. And I'd also like to just thank um, Josette personally with Borders for um, being the bookseller this evening and selling wonderful books from around the world. I'm the founder of Mending Nations, and I wanted to just um, briefly talk about how Mending Nations started. It started several years ago after I met Lely Bakhtiar Van Dillen, and we've had uh, many, many discussions about Iran and the Bakhtiari tribes. And quite frankly, I didn't know much about the Bakhtiari tribes before I met Lely. Uh, what I knew about Iran was what I'd read in the newspapers or seen uh, on the television. And it was obviously more slanted toward the p political side. So after many years of speaking with Lely, I've learned quite a bit about the Bakhtiari tribes. I've learned that they're the oldest continuous migrating tribe on the face of the world over 5,000 years. And I've learned about their migrations up and down the Zagros Mountains. I've heard about places like Chahar Mahal and Isfahan and had many, many cups of chai tea. <laughs> Later, I met Luba Brezhnev and Miriam Chavez. And again, I didn't know a whole lot about Cuba, and I knew some about Russia, but not a lot. And after speaking with them for quite a few months, I learned much more about Cuba and Russia. I learned about the great cafe societies in Cuba. I learned about the great family traditions that are still carried out today. And in Russia, I learned about the great spirit of the people. Even though they've been through many difficult times, their spirit is incredibly strong. So what happened with me personally is I noticed that my heart and my spirit really shifted towards Iran and Cuba and Russia. And I went from a spirit of caution to one of passion for the people and the traditions and the cultures of these countries. So we all sat around at dinner one night and decided that we needed to have a Mending Nations program to educate people and through great literature. So with that, I'd like to start with Miriam and ask Miriam, uh, you were born in Cuba and then you came to America with your parents and perhaps you could discuss uh, what happened, what were the circumstances that were around that? Um, I was born in Cuba and uh I, uh, in 1959, my sister uh, was born, but my father, instead of in the hospital with my mother, he was in the, in the uh, Sierra Maestra Mountains with Fidel Castro. He was a revolutionary, and as you know, Batista was the dictator at the time, and uh, they, Fidel Castro had a lot of support of the whole country. There are revolutionaries in the mountains. They came down from the mountains and took over uh, Havana and the government and, Cast and, and Batista left in New Year's Eve um, and left with a couple of his family and friends and, um, and left the country. So my father was very, very involved in, in, in changing the b beginning of the, of the government. He, was, he didn't ever take part in the, in the government of Fidel Castro because he was a journalist and a, and a, a newspaper man. And uh, he started, he had a, a radio show, and uh, a couple of months after Fidel Castro took over, they started curtailing his, his, his radio show, and he couldn't say this, and he couldn't say that. Then Fidel Castro aligned himself, as you know, with the Soviet Union, and my father, in the middle of the night, with 12 of other people that were in the Sierra Maestra Mountains with him, left in a small boat, and ended up in McAllen, Texas, in an uh, immigration detention center. Uh, my mother and my sister and myself were, were left in Cuba, and Fidel Castro signed uh, permission for us to be able to leave. Um, we went to Mexico City, and we ended up in Miami, met my father after the Bay of Pigs in 1961. Um, Miami at that time was very, very a very strange place because there were a lot of people from the Batista regime. They were there, and then all these new people from, from the... Um, that were, were responsible for, for putting Castro in power were there also. So there's a lot of conflict and, and, and commotion going on. My father has started a radio show in the garage of our house, and we had to be really, really quiet at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. 
because my father would tape this radio show, which was all political and had to do with Batista and what was happening and with Castro. And all throughout my life, he always wanted to re-establish re re relationships with Cuba because he also, he always thought that through, through communication, you were going to get more done than through embargoes and hate and, 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 and different things that went on during, during uh, the time um, in Miami. So during the, all, all throughout my life, I always was taught that through communication and, and, and uh, exchange, a lot more will, will get accomplished. And now your full name is Miriam Lesnick Chavez, and so you married into the Chavez family. Cesar Chavez is your father-in-law. And many of us know him as the deceased labor leader, but many of us don't know him as a human being. Do you have a personal story about Cesar? Um, I met my husband in 1980 when I wor worked for the Kennedy campaign. Edward Kennedy was running for president, and I had just graduated from uh, Columbia U University uh, Graduate School of International Affairs, and I, had, I, I was called to work in Senator Edward Kennedy's Senate office, and then he, started, he began his Kennedy campaign to run for president, and I switched over. And my husband came from California, and he was the la Latino at that time. It was Hispanic coordinator. That's what we would call his Latinos, Hispanic coordinator at the time for the whole country. And I met him there. And after a couple of months of getting to know my husband, I realized uh, that we had very similar upbringing. And they always, always the same thing, always very unpopular. My, my father and Caesar always had unpopular views with the majority of the people. And he was always, but they never, never wavered. And they always had the same the same uh, ideas and never, never switched up no matter how hard everything really got. Uh, my husband always tells this great story about his father that I've read everything probably has been published on Caesar and all his biographies and I haven't read this little story which is very telling of how Caesar is and was and, and, and it because is because he's still with us and uh, and, and how he really raised his family and how, what kind of man he really was. It was during the height of his, of his fame and he was a threat to everyone. Uh, big corporations didn't like him. He was saying things that, that, that no one wanted to hear. So the Johnson administration uh, offered him to head the Peace Corps in Latin America. And that was a job that uh, a lot of people probably, I think, um, Sergeant Shriver took that job uh, a little later on. It was a very, very prestigious job. But basically, he knew that they were offering him this job so he could leave the country, not organize farm workers, and stop making waves. So he sat the whole family down. The whole family lived in a house, no more. They, they were, my husband's one of eight. So they lived in a two-bedroom house with, in Delano with one bathroom and in a very, very poor area. And my mother-in-law was still working as a farm worker and com coming home and cooking these huge meals for eight children and, uh, and my, my uh, father-in-law sat everyone down and said, I have been offered a job. He always had dinner at a certain time every night. I have been offered a job in Latin America. And this job will take us, I think it was Buenos Aires or Ch uh, Santiago, I, I'm not sure. But uh, we've been offered this job, I've been offered this job, but I really, I want to discuss it with the family. Now, I have to tell you that this is organizing uh, the Peace Corps, and it's going to be a job where you're going to have live in a big, huge house. Everybody's going to have their own room. And your mother is going to be able to have somebody help her with the cooking, and you're not going to have to make your own beds and not clean up. You're going to be, and you're going to go to private schools. And we're probably going to have a chauffeur, because in Latin America, we're probably going to have a chauffeur. Yes, a chauffeur. And then also, I think we're going to have a huge, the house, I think we're, we're told, has a pool. And it's going to be a great, great life. You're going to all learn how to speak perfect Spanish. Um, they all spoke Spanish, but this was going to be, this is going to be much better because you're going to speak Spanish all the time. Your grandmother can come with us. It's going to be a great life. So I want to take a vote, and I want all of you to vote and really think. And I don't want you to talk to your brothers or sisters. It's just going to be something that you're going to decide on your own. Now. Who would want to go to Latin America so I can organize the Peace Corps? But I have to tell you, before you vote, if we go, we cannot organize farm workers. And the farm workers won't have someone organizing them. And I'd just like to re really you close your eyes and, and raise your hand. So everyone voted to stay, except Bertie, who was three years old. And he says, I want to go. So I, that's basically very telling because, again, 
the whole family, the whole United Farm Workers and the whole movement was basically a family effort. And without all the family and all the, all the people that helped, we, we wouldn't have gotten where it, where, where it is today. Thank you for that great story. Well, many of us know that uh, there have been strained relationships between Cuba and America for decades. But your parents just took a trip to Cuba, and you go every year. And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, what the atmosphere is like in Cuba today. Um, I go every year, like uh, Sue said, to Cuba. Um, I take my children every year because I, li like my father and Caesar always used to say that if you don't know who you are, you don't know where you're going or, or where you're going to end up. So I take them to Cuba and I also take them to La Paz where my mother-in-law is to see how, wh where the, it's a union headquarters and to be with their cousins for a couple of weeks during the summer. Um, my parents just came back, they go more often than I do, and they just came back and they say every year it, it changes and it's much better. Um, and this year, when they just returned, they said that there were a lot of Americans there. And uh, that's really unusual, because three years ago, there were no Americans. And now, in the last year, there were a little bit more, and this year, there's a lot. But they said, my parents also said, that they are not taking their children yet. And uh, I guess they're a little hesitant, but I think next year, you're going to see American children. You're going to see, the more they go, the more you see that it's a great place, and it's a, it's a wonderful place to see. And uh, I think it's going to be really, really great. Every year it changes and it becomes a little bit better. Now, you wrote a book, too, called Sacrifice. And it's going to be published next year. And so we'll come back to that. And you can read a little bit about that in a Thank moment. Thank you. Now we'll go to Luba Brezhnev, who she is the niece of Leonid Brezhnev and also the author of The World I Left Behind. And my question for you, Luba, is why did you sacrifice everything you had in Russia to come to America and write The World I Left Behind? Thank you, Sue. It's a very good question. I'm often asked by Americans and also by Russians, why was I living that was most dear to me, my relatives, my friends, my job, my home? And what was the reason for this kind of sacrifice? And why did I have to choose to live the hard life in a new country. Uh, at the end of 80s, I was aware that Americans and Russians had a unique and uh, great opportunity to establish a new civilized relationship and to know each other better and to become friends. And I decided to come to America and to uh, share with Americans who had an approximate idea about Russia and Russians, my life experience, my knowledge, and to, have, uh, to help Americans to understand events in former Soviet Union. Unfortunately, uh, Russian knowledge of America and Americans, and I'm talking about uh, average people in general, can be summed up in a few words. McDonald's, Jeans, and Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> and the uh, American knowledge of Russia and Russians is uh, almost at, at the same level as Kremlin, Vodka, and Gorbachev. So, but I know that the, the Russians who know better Americans or have Americans' friends or to, or to live or to work of, or, or work with Americans, they say Americans are great guys, they're hard workers, and we have a lot of, to learn of, from them. For example, how to do business, or how to be patient and tolerant and polite. And Americans who live with Russians or work with Russians, they say, I've never seen warmer, kinder, and more charming people than Russians. That's what comes from knowledge of each other. Um, and when I came to America, I didn't speak any English, and I knew only two, two sentences. My name is Luba, and, and I love you. And I was very lucky, <laughs> because with two sentences, I signed a contract with Random House in a few months. And my, my editor, a uh, very lovely gentleman, we are still in touch, and we're still friends. He's, uh, he, he has been work in Random House for 47 years. He told me, Luba, it's just you came to America and you, you said, my name is Luba, I love you, and we signed a contract. Um, so 
here in, in this hall, I have two friends, my very close friends. We are friends for seven years, right? Mike and Morfor and um, Dale uh, Berman, when they made me seven years ago, I didn't speak English, it was a hard time. <laughs> so, and um, uh, for many years we we'll leave, we were sure, Americans and Russians, uh, that all our misfortunes came from communism, but now the Cold War is ended and the Communist Party doesn't exist anymore. But we are still facing and very serious problems, not only ethnic and national problems, but the problems between Russians and, and uh, Americans. Unfortunately, most of people live uh, by the principle if I don't understand it, I don't like it, and I, I don't accept it. And I decided to write my book, which was published in, uh, by Random House in 1995, and uh, this is the book not about the pol politics or political situation or about my uncle. This is the book about myself, about my family, about my people, about my country, about its soul and, and, and heart. And this is the book, a little bit about my uncle, of course, but it's not about Leonid Brezhnev as a politician, but as, as a human being. Thank you. So, Luba, you've, you've told me many times about the great spirit of the Russian people. And could you tell us a little story about the common people in Russia? Yeah, it's with my pleasure, because I like to talk about average Russians. Um, Unfortunately, um, in the recent years, which have been very important for relationship between Americans and Russians, most of coverage of Russia presented to Americans has shown the most negative aspect of Russian life. And um, there had n practically nothing about Russian culture, Russian history, Russian poetry, Russian literature, but there has uh, had plenty to see and read about Russian crime, Russian corruption, and mafia. And this gives uh, a very t a terribly distorted portrait to Russians. However, Russia is the country of a very high spiritual culture. Currently, as you know, Russia is struggling, trying to survive and to solve economic and social problems. And, but uh, her spirit is very strong, and f her faith is very strong. Um, people are going hunger, hungry, but it's still very hard to get a ticket to a play. People have been lost the faith in the government, but the churches are full. And I would like to talk about average people, for example, about a little Russian seven-year girl who lately walked about 100 miles with her parents to visit the holy grave of one of the most beloved saints of Russia, or about Russian doctors who, unpaid for months, uh, continue to treat and <coughs> operate on patients, or about uh, Russian ch teachers who, also unpaid for months, continue to teach the children. They are the true face of Russia. Thank you. Your uncle, Leonid Brezhnev, he taught you a very valuable lesson about life through borscht. Could you tell us that story? Uh, yeah, um, but before I'll go to the story, it's a funny story, I would like to read a very small piece of my book using glasses, unfortunately. When several days after the funeral of my uncle, my father came to my home his blood pressure had shot up, his eyes were still red, his face was blushed. I invited him to stay for supper. He sat down on the bench in my kitchen and then, without saying a word, laid his head on the table and began to sob. I'm like a dog without its master, he told me as he wiped his tears. They lost a general secretary, I lost a brother. So millions of people in Russia and former Soviet Union lost uh, Leonid, Leonid Brezhnev as a general secretary. I lost my uncle. So my point is that 
He never was a general secretary to me. He was just an uncle, the person I loved, the person who took care of me, and the person who gave me a lot of lessons. By the way, uh, this night I got a call from Moscow, and uh, I'm going to publish my book in Moscow. Uh, it's coming out in October. And the editor called me and told Luba, just a recent poll in the former Soviet Union shown that your uncle, Leonid Brezhnev, was the best politician of this century. And they call his period, his era, as uh, the golden socialism. And uh, when they ask the people, the thousands of people, uh, for whom they will vote tomorrow, the answer was for Leonid Brezhnev. And uh, I want to go to, to the funny story. When I was a teenager, teen, so my uncle loved very much borscht. You know, the most of men, most of people in Russia, they're crazy about borscht. There are some people who eat borscht three times a day. So and my uncle belonged to this kind of people. If, uh, if, uh, if there wasn't borscht, uh, it, uh, he, he thought that it's, it's nothing to eat in the house. So, and when I was a teen, te teen, I don't remember, 13 or 14 years old, I decided to please him and surprise him, and I made a borscht for him, and I forgot to put their beets. <laughs> but without beets, it's no borscht. You can just throw it in the garbage. And my uncle said, my dear, never remember about main ingredients in your life. And I remember this, and I'm trying not to forget about main details in my life, main <laughs> things. Thank you. Thank you for that great story, too. And we'll come back to another reading from The World I Left Behind. And now I'd like to move over to Laylee Bechtiar Van Dillen. She's an award-winning poet and has a new novel out called Harem Letters. And I have some questions for you as well. Uh, the first is, in many ways, our nation is in a cultural revolution. And how do you see your work and mending nations assisting that mending? Thank you, Sue. It's a good question, the concept of cultural revolution and mending nations. My novel, Harem Letters, is basically based on the life of Dr. Abul Hassan Bakhtiar, who is from a 5,000-year-old nomadic tribe living in the Zagros Mountains. He's from a tiny village of Burujan. And from this village, he completed his education by the age of 10. He sat on a, in a, on a small carpet out under a tent. And after he could read Arabic and the Quran, his education was considered complete. What he came to learn later when he befriended Shapur Bakhtiar's family. Shapur Bakhtiar was the former prime minister of Iran, and he was the prime minister in 1979. Just at the time the Shah of Iran was leaving Iran, he wanted to be sure the parliament had approved Shapur to be the next prime minister so he wouldn't leave the nation in anarchy. Shapur was elected um, as or nominated as prime minister, and he was uh, assassinated in, eight years ago in 1991. I had met him in 1989. At any rate, back in Burujan village in the Zagros Mountains, these two men were friends, and they both ha believed in the concept of knowledge, the concept that words can heal, the importance of education. Consequently, many of the Bakhtiari who were shepherds who have flocks. My grandfather, for example, before he came to America to become a physician, he was a peddler of fruits until he was 40 years old, realizing in his poverty that he would never amount to anything. Uh, one of the BB queens in the tribe went, took him to the capital, Tehran, where another Bakhtiar before Shapur, it was actually Shapur's uncle, was prime minister as well. And eventually, he met a Presbyterian missionary. He was invited to America in 1919 after World War I. And he came at 40, speaking little English, went to Syracuse University, then medical school at Syracuse. And then he wanted to return in 1929, during our Great Depression, with his wife as a career doctor to help the poor and needy. They had no hospitals in Iran. And if you were dying, you were taken in a wheelbarrow 
to a Maddie's Hune, a sick house. So my grandfather and grandmother were the first uh, physician and nurse in Iran and wiped out malaria. They believed, back to the concept of mending nations, that what was critical to humans and civilizations to continue to understand each other was to become educated. And so they believed in the healing power of words. And myself as a journalist uh, and a fiction author and my friends, Luba and Miriam, this is what we believe in, reconciliation and hope through understanding and enriching our lives and by learning about other cultures. You visited Iran in 1997. And are there still sacred rites that are, are exercised there as tradition with the elders? It's a very important question. I think universally the concept of elders in Iran today, I was there two years ago, and every home I went to to eat a sofre, uh, a sofre is when you spread a big Persian rug, well, the Persian rugs are on every floor, but then a tablecloth on the carpet so that 20, 30 people can sit around that sofre and eat. The concept of the elders, when you come into a home, there's an image of a grandfather or grandmother who may have passed away. And the youth seek the elders for their wisdom. This is how cultures are continued, by passing on the, the stories of the elders. And when I met Shapur in Paris, this was, again, the same quest to return to one's roots, to ask of the senior citizens um, the most serious questions about your life. And in this case, I, of course, I asked him about the revolution. I asked him about, I, we had hoped to work together because I spoke uh, French. I have a master's degree in French literature, and he speaks better French than English. And my Farsi is improving, but it's still not there. So at any rate, what I learned from Shapur and I can never forget it. This is the kind of experience one has in Iran, sitting with elders throughout the day and having chai. He said, Laili, if you look into the eyes of democracy, what you'll see is suffering. It's a great price one must pay for democracy. He also said, I believe the human mind grows naturally toward democracy. And Shapur had certainly had the life experience. His, he had been imprisoned by the same Shah who actually put him um, back into power, if you will, or approved of his power. So the concept of going to the elders was a ritual that I saw in poorer families in the cities of Esfahan, Shiraz. We went into the old Kuche, the old streets, and talked with the nanes. They are the old family, wise women who have a thousand eyes, and I write about them in harem letters. Your mother is an expatriate from Iran, and your father is a retired Navy officer. This must have impressed upon you a great need to be a communicator and bridge east and west. Did your writing come from this? Yes. My father's Irish and my mother's Iranian. So being Irish-Iranian, there was an incredible amount of energy in our family. And my father came from four generations of Irish sea captains from the United States Naval Academy. There are McNair Roads on the academy grounds. There's a USS McNair. Uh, there's a Fort McNair in Washington, DC. And yes, indeed, I observed as a child. I'm a family of six. From a family of six, I have five brothers. And I observed, uh, for survival's sake, I observed these two cultures, my, my Iranian mother, my American, Irish father, they've been married 49 years, try to put these stories together and weave a life of cultural reconciliation. And my, all my work is about reconciliation. All my work is about the hope of understanding that two people can come to understand the mystery of life, the mystery of another person's tribe or clan. And indeed, my mother had complete um, respect for this Navy clan, these Irish warriors, if you will, um, these seafaring captains. And she adored it. Now, I must admit, the story, as the story goes, my 17-year-old Persian mother at the time went with my 27-year-old father to Annapolis, Maryland, the home of the United States Naval Academy, where my grandfather, Captain, and Mrs. McNair were awaiting to see his new, uh, shall we say, fiance. <laughs> and my, 
He had seven sisters with curly blonde Irish hair and extremely fair skin. And we, when he arrived on his doorstep uh, with a, a very exotic 17-year-old <laughs> Persian woman, you, it raised eyebrows. I don't, I don't think they, I think they were speechless. At any rate, what I have seen in, in terms of reconciliation and what is possible between a man and a woman, a family life, is respect between them. There was a lot of times not understanding. My father also loved Bakhtiari food. The Bakhtiaris did not come for one night. They came for months and years. <laughs> He, one day at breakfast, on the, my father's mother was from the Chief Justice John Marshall family, and there was a very, we have their formal dining room table, and my father, there were about 20 at the breakfast table, and my father said to this Iranian gentleman, well, have you enjoyed your stay in America? And he said, oh, yes, Mr. McNair, this has been wonderful. And he went on to ask him numerous questions, and he said, well, now how long have you been here? And he said, for about a month. And he said, and where have you been staying? And he said, well, Mr. McNair, upstairs in your home. <laughs> <laughs> and this is very typical, and it's, it's actually quite typical of my home today. Um, I welcome a lot of cultures in my home, and, and I believe that it, the stories that I've written in Harem Letters reflect how hope can continue through sharing cultural stories. Thank you, and we'll come back to a reading from Harem Letters. May I add a few words about sure. Amazing Nations? Sure. Thank you. So, uh, as I already said, that uh, most of people are living by the principle, if I don't understand, I don't love it, and I don't accept it. And uh, the most destructive prejudices are those based on religion, ethnicity, and nationality. And I have, I have been experienced of uh, some of them. When I was a young girl, and I fell in love with a German man, German military pilot, my uncle, who was the first person in the country, he was a general secretary, he said, uh, aren't there any more Russian men? It Was it necessary to fall in love with, with, with German men? And when later, um, when later I, uh, I married a, an Armenian guy, so he, my mother-in-law <laughs> accused her son of having half Russian children. So I just, uh, and I remember that uh, actually I was uh, in the same way somehow because I give you an example when my ex-husband uh, signed a contract with, uh, with an Algerian university and we came to Algeria in 1978, I felt so isolated from this country and I was so miserable and I just had negative feeling to, toward this country. Everything smelled different and, and didn't look like in Russia. And my, my uh, ex-husband uh, said, either you stay and try to understand this country and love these people and to be happy, or you have to go back to Moscow. And I didn't have any choice, and I, I stayed, and I did my best to understand this country. I gained a lot, of, a lot of friends there, and I loved them very much, and I was happy, and when the time to leave came, I, I cried. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that story. And now Miriam's going to read a passage from her soon-to-be released book, Sacrifice, and she's going to set up that whole scene for us. Um, yes, this is, uh, I was, uh, I took a year off from law school and went to live in the Dominican Republic because I always thought that I was so, um, I was very confused in the United States. I thought, I, I felt American one day and then maybe Latin American another day. And I just had to go somewhere. I couldn't go to Cuba because at the time, no one was going to Cuba. So I went to live in the Dominican Republic where my grandfather had a house. So, and I worked for a TV station. This book idea came from my years living there. And uh, I, uh, I think the chapter speaks for itself. It, uh, is a, it's about an American woman that marries a Latin American and goes to live in the country. A Dominican wife, breakfast 8.30, Spanish, Doctora Valls, 10 o'clock, dance, Gustavo Teles, 11, lunch, 12.30, siesta, 2, free time, 3 to 5, riding, Carol Ochoa, 5.30, dinner, 7.30. Tuesdays, instead of riding, gourmet cooking, entertaining. Monday, instead of dance, massage. Tuesday, instead of Spanish and dance, manicure, pedicure. Sandy's days were planned by Esmeralda. Lozano thought it was kind of his aunt to take the time. And the days marched on. 
The first year she saw only her teachers, manicurist, hairdresser, and the servants. She was expected to dress in black dresses. All of the paintings and the mirrors in the villa were covered with black cloth. The Laforts were in mourning, and life would resume in one year. Lozano was traveling more, and Sandy spent much of her time alone. Lately, he was leaving for two weeks at a time. She returned, he returned, was, his return was always full of fun and romance. That kept her going. And boxes from Valentino, Escola de la Renta, and Hermes, Christian Dior, arrived at Via Flores almost every day that first year. Chiffon evening gowns and Italian silk dresses and alligator shoes with matching purses filled her closet. Every Saturday evening, Lozano gave her a piece of jewelry to go with her new clothes. Some of the pieces had been his grandmother's and others he had sent from Harry Winston in New York. And emerald necklaces and diamond ear clips filled her jewelry chest. Esmeralda became excited every time Sandy received a new piece of jewelry. She gave her suggestions. Sandy should wear her hair pulled back with almost the most elaborate necklaces and ear clips. It was more flattering to the face and showed off the stones. Diamonds were not to be worn in the daytime. She suggested pearls. After a few months of practice, Sandy looked like a Dominican wife of the Lafort social class. Sandy avoided Esmeralda when the subject was not clothes, hair, or jewelry, and tensions were high when they were in the same room. One day, they had a confrontation, and Sandy knew it was just a matter of time. It happened in the library, and Esmeralda approached her from the back. What are you doing in here? Esmeralda stood by the door, looking for computer paper. I want to print out a letter. Sandy had already seen the stacks of money in the boxes, and there must have been thousands of dollar bills. Next time, ask Patricio. This office should be blocked. It's off limits. My husband died in here, and I don't want you snooping around. Doña Esmeralda was not snooping. Esmeralda turned around and left. Why would they have all this mu cash running, lying around? Next time, she checked, the office was locked. When she asked Lozano, he told her the money was to be deposited in Switzerland. We always have to be prepared for the worst, he said. He did not elaborate, and the time passed slowly. Well, I'm looking forward to the release of this book so we can read more. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> And now Luba is going to read a passage from The World I Left Behind about her uncle, Leonard Brezhnev, as the human being. Yeah, as, as you know, or maybe you remember, that my uncle uh, organized a conspiracy against Khrushchev, and he succeeded him in, in October 1964. Actually, it was very easy, because at that time, not only Politburo, but the whole country was sick and tired of uh, Nikita Khrushchev's experiments. Uh, so, and I would like to read a small piece uh, about my uncle, what happened uh, um, uh, after he became the general secretary. Once soon after Leonid had become first secretary, he took a walk in the woods with my father. Because my father had played such a vital role in the revolt, Leonid felt a special gratitude toward him. Yasha, he sighed, I don't know how long I'll live. I don't even think about it. I only think about how we can do more for our people. They have suffered greatly and deserve better. Our extreme poverty has always shocked me. Are Russians worse than Czechs or Germans? They should eat their fill and sleep in comfort if you want them to work well. Was my uncle really concerned about the people's needs? Did he sincerely believe that he had been selected by fate to be their benefactor? Like any politician, he needed to feel that his actions were justified. He had often repeated the formula, the people are not here to save us. We are here to, ser to serve us. We are here to serve the people. But this idea faded and was forgotten as the years passed. I have no intention of making excuses for him, but it would be unfair to deny that he loved his country. He did. In his own way, he wanted to make the Soviet Union more prosperous and more happy, but he did not believe, after a certain point at least, in the triumph of socialism, in Marxism-Leninist principles, or in the possibility of communism. It was the late 60s. During another one of their frequent walks in the woods, Yakov, my father, himself a party member, um, uh, I'm sorry, asked his brother, general secretary of the Communist Party, what do you think, Leonia? Will communists ever come? Leonid laughed without uh, mirth. 
Oh, for heaven's sake, Yasha, what are you talking about? All this stuff about communism is a tall tale for popular consumption. After all, we cannot leave the people with no faith. The church was taken away, the czar was shot, and something had to be substituted. So let the people build communism. My father came away from this conversation deeply disappointed. I would like to read uh, uh, one more very short. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> <It's attacking you. laughs> I'm struggling with my book and this mic. Later my, father, later my father admitted that a few weeks before Lenin's de uh, death, he had called him, something he did rarely, only when his wife was not around to know, and said, Yasha, I can feel that the end is near. I'd like to be able to start everything again, uh, again from the beginning, but my strength is gone. I'm so tired. Tired of what? My father asked. I'm tired of living, answered Melanit, Leonid and hung up. When my father related this short conversation to me, I sensed immediately that my uncle had been reaching out for understanding and forgiveness. Who besides his brother was, felt, uh, for, uh, was left for him to, com to confine in? Thank you very much. It must I'm have, still struggling with my English, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been extraordinary being the niece of a great man like Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, on one hand, yes, because I'm kind of proud of being the niece of this guy because he, he was a really nice and kind person and very honest person, very de decent person. And finally, the people, Russian people, realize it right now. So uh, s starving to death right now and seeing the, ca the, the Russia falling apart. Uh, but on the other side, of course, it wasn't easy because I always felt like a, like a, you know, a goldfish in some bowl or whatever. <laughs> everybody could come to my life, and uh, you know, everybody was curious about my private life, about my business life, about my friends, about my children. So it was a kind of hard. So, Laylee, your next question is that Mending Nations is about educating ourselves through literature about different cultures and traditions. And I believe that you're going to read a piece from Harem Letters. Is it the bathhouse or the bazaar? The bathhouse. Great. Persia is an ancient land which, like many in the Middle East or Near East, is dusty. And people are on foot and labor throughout the day. What they look forward to at the end of the day is to go to the hammam, which is the bathhouse. And this is not just a ritual cleansing, but it's also a time to socialize and a time to hear the politics of the day, the news of the day, and perhaps the matchmaker might be in the hammam. So there are a thousand eyes in the hammam. And this is a story of where the mother is going to take her four daughters. The, the story is about four sisters. And these four sisters are young and in Persia, and they're going with their mother. Their mother is actually American, and their Aunt Daisy has come from the United States to visit them. But she sees everything in Persia as unclean and debatable. So it begins a little bit with Aunt Daisy. We drop Aunt Daisy off at home since she is not comfortable to go to the open hammam bathhouse, which Mama loves. I want Aunt Daisy taken to the Great Salt Desert forever. The five of us continue our whirling day with the ritual cleansing. On entering the dark hammam, Mama visibly relaxes. Old Nane Parsi arranges our clothes and we disrobe and wrap in soft towels immediately. Inside the great cavernous hammam, five human washers approach us. Are they relics from the past? We sit on the wet tiles. The dripping steam falls from the tall glass dome down by our sides. Our hair is scrubbed with piquant vinegars for shine and oils and essences for scent. We are served sweet, juicy pomegranates, quinces, barberries, and mulberries, while our feet are ground into smooth flesh with pumice rock. The skin on our backs is shed for new skin with a rough scrub pad. Mama is massaged as well and her body oiled with attar of roses as though preparing for her death. After many hours of cleaning and polishing, nibbling on honeyed tea and sweets, 
and drinking a 3,000-year-old lemonade recipe, we are driven home for our afternoon nap. Mama insists, since we have a big occasion coming up, we must rest a few days. She's always preventing us from tiredness, so we will be immune to the exposure of bacteria and viruses. At the end of this story, the four sisters find out that there was a matchmaker in the bazaar that day. And the matchmaker will soon visit that family, and one of the girls will have a marriage proposal. And that's an, a very interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> a marriage proposal she doesn't want. <laughs> I think Albert Einstein summed this whole Mending Nations theme up years and years ago. He said, life cannot long endure on, a ba on the basis of a crude force. Understanding for our neighbors, justice in our dealings, willingness to help, can give human society permanence. And so what I'd like to do now is open the floor um, for questions. But what we'll have to do is wait until Daphne can get to you with the microphone so that we can capture the question and people won't have to repeat again. Do we have any questions for um, Laylee or Luba or Miriam? No? Everything is clear. Then I will ask a question. And I will ask a question of Laylee. Um, you are from a revolutionary family. And do you see yourself as a literary revolution? Yes, I do see myself as a literary revolutionary. The story I told about Shapur Bakhtiar is a very personal family story. He was on the front cover of Time magazine, and he lost his life assassinated in Paris in a very brutal way. And some people, such as Shapur, he said, I was asked and called to come and help the people. I had devoted my life and sacrificed my, had given my body as living sacrifice to our nation and to the poor and the needy. In my particular case, my type of sacrifice is really as an author to share the stories of people such as Shapur. I share them in fiction. Uh, the characters are fictionalized, though. It's based on the Bakhtiari and what I've known of these people's incredible commitment, their toughness, uh, their endurance in a very inhospitable, indomitable part of the world, the Zagros Mountains, and the kind of courage that it has taken for people like that to be on a path, a quest, a journey for knowledge and understanding of other nations. The Persians I grew up with in the tribe believe that we are all gateways to all other nations. And in that case, my writing is, is perhaps revolutionary in that it aspires and continues to hope. And it refuses to be apathetic. Do we have any questions? I visited the Soviet Union in 1962. And uh, if there are not going to be any other questions, uh, I will give some information and then ask a question. Or if you want one quick Could question. you give us a quick question? Uh, for which I am highly prepared. Uh, I cannot state a quick question. That's not what I had in mind. But I will make it much briefer. Thank you. I was uh, visiting a, a children's summer camp in Leningrad uh, with a group of 20 people. And the uh, director came to us. And we had an interpreter. And uh, then we had our opportunity to ask a question. Uh, if we wanted to. And I was the first, and my question was, have you noticed that children are cruel to each other? And if so, uh, what do you do to correct that? So uh, I would like to ask you what your answer is, and then if I may, I will give the answer that the director gave and then what happened afterwards? You mean that you made, uh, you have some, you had the information about 
the children, Russian children, who are cruel toward each other? That is the question I asked him. Uh, because I had something... Maybe I missed something. I, I don't remember that we were really cruel toward each other in the Soviet Union. Well, I think children all over the world are cruel to each other. <laughs> yeah, they're sense. selfish, uh, <laughs> but not more. Russian children are not more cruel than any other children. Yes. So, and, yes. yeah. They, it, it, maybe it's better to talk about childhood, about children at that time in the 60s <coughs> and now. This is the big difference. It's better to talk about this. What is the difference between the children of 1962 and the children of 1990? Uh, okay, this is now it's a big difference. If you saw there the children in the uh, summer uh, camp, and mo most of children, okay, the most of you uh, were allowed to the summer uh, camp. I grew up in the summer camp, for example. Okay, it was a common. Th uh, case. Thousands and of we were very, at that uh, time. Yeah, thousands and thousands, millions, and we were very happy to go there. So, because, you know, I remind, uh, uh, okay, uh, going back to the 60s, I remember that one of my friends, I was a student at that time, and I remember that one of my friends, he was French, he came from uh, Sorbonne University, from Paris, and he came first time, he visited the first time the Soviet Union, and he stayed there a few months, and I asked him, oh, what is the most wonderful that you saw in Soviet Union? He said, the most, the, the, the most beautiful and the most wonderful in Soviet Union is, this, is the happy childhood. Mm -hmm. We had a special, you know, that our children, you know, always were to care of you know nobody was indifferent toward our uh, for of our children for our children we had the special pioneer pioneers palaces you know we had the special overclasses i don't know i don't know groups you know the children could had um, could stand after uh, classes after lessons and they spend time in the schools so it was a kind of you know they were to care now with the children are polishing of new Russians' shoes. Now the children are washing their cars. Now the children are selling newspapers on the streets. Now the children, instead to go to the school, they're selling their bodies because mm -hmm. their parents don't know how to make money, how to survive in this messy country. That's what is the big difference between children at 60s and children. Thank you. So it's too late to, cook, to talk about. Unfortunately, we're, we're very Sorry. short on our time, but we can come back to that question in just a moment. You don't, I, you don't want to hear what the director said and what happened. I'd love to hear it. We'll come right back to it in a moment. Um, but I do have another question for Miriam that has to do with children, and that is, could you tell us about the children in Cuba and perhaps their I, uh, I agree with Luba because they, in Cuba they also have pioneer camps and the children are the, the, the country revolves around the children and uh, they're very, very special. And uh, I was in a, in, a, in a school, many schools that I visit and I take my children to and the children are, as opposed to here that in public school that a lot of the teachers don't get involved with children are cruel to each other, over there they really intervene. So it's it's basically there there it's it's um it's more of a a softer touch and of course I'm generalizing but uh, when I take my children to, to to Cuba I also take them to ballparks and they and the children are are so happy playing baseball with uh with without gloves and with uh, a ball made of, of of a big piece of cloth and I to tell my children look they're the base best baseball players in the world and they don't need $150 bats. And, uh, and my children go, oh, yes, okay. And then of course they, 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 they take that and say agree and then they come to the United States and they want the $150 bat. What can I tell you? <laughs> Thank you. Well, unfortunately we do have to close and we'll come back to your question after we close the program. Um, Layli is going to recite a poem by Rumi who is from Iran and it's about reunification. Could you read that? or? Recite it for I us. I have it memorized. Rumi is a classic Persian poet, and this piece from Rumi reminds us that it's never too late to begin again. It's never too late to come together. And it goes like this. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover. 
This is not a caravan of despair. Still, if you've broken va your vows even a thousand times, still and yet come again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to Mending Nations. <laughs>